him after class. Um, so he's wanting me to go over a couple of reactions. I'm assuming they're all new to you. So the first reaction is the treatment of aldehydes or ketones. And I'm sure he's told you that aldehydes and ketones do the exact same mechanisms. And so they're grouped together. Aldehydes and ketones can be treated with amines. Okay. Under acidic conditions. Okay. And so they're pretty picky about what they do. And so what do I mean by that? You have primary amines. And primary amines just means that there's one R group on a nitrogen. Okay. And when you treat aldehydes or ketones, I'm just gonna introduce the aldehyde plus the primary amine under acidic conditions. What you get is, oh, excuse me, an imine. Okay. And what I want you to note is that all that's occurred is the replacement of that carbonyl oxygen with the nitrogen primary group. Okay. So it's still a double bonded system. It's still a pi system, but now it's not double bonded with an oxygen. It's actually double bonded with a nitrogen. Okay. Okay, he also wants me to go over the mechanism with you guys. Because it's under acidic conditions, you use the acid and then you regenerate the acid in the end, right? So I'm just doing the mechanism with an aldehyde functionality group. The same is true with ketones, which is perfect. If you know aldehydes, you know ketones. I'll use sulfuric acid as my acid catalyst, but you can use any acid whatsoever. So step one, oxygen gets protonated and you form your conjugate base. And you've got your protonated oxygen. Step two, your nucleophile comes in, and in this case, it's your amine, specifically your primary amine. And it attacks the carbonyl oxygen. And if you follow your arrows, you form an alcohol functional group. Your nitrogen is on the carbonyl carbon and it's positively charged. Okay. If you look at your product, your carbon has no OH or no oxygen. So I need to get rid of the OH in some form and you get rid of it in the form of water. So it does a proton, ooh, excuse me, a proton transfer. Proton transfer. And now I've got a great leaving group. Water's a great leaving group. It can pop off on its own or it can get some help from the lone pairs on the nitrogen. So one of the byproducts to the reaction is the formation of a water molecule. And you've done acetal chemistry, hemiacetal chemistry, I'm assuming, and you've noticed that that's always the byproduct, the formation of water. And so it's starting to look like 
what we want with the exception of that positive charge on the nitrogen. And the only way to get rid of that is to regenerate our acid. If our acid is our catalyst, not only do you use it, but you regenerate it at the end, right? And so my conjugate base comes back in. The protonates, and I get my imine. I regenerate my acid and waters my byproduct. Okay. Again, this works just as great with ketones as our starting material. It's specific to aldehydes and ketones. Okay. The other thing that I want to say about this reaction is that this reaction only works for primary amines. And you can see why it only works for primary amines. You need two hydrogens. Two hydrogens are being removed in the mechanism. So you need to have those two specific hydrogens. And so you can only use primary amines. So let me give you another example that he's asked me to present. Okay. And I'll use a ketone this time around. And specifically, I'll use acetone. And ethylamine in phosphoric acid. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this reaction, the first thing you should look for is at the amine. Is it a primary amine? Is it a secondary amine? Is it a tertiary amine? If it's a primary amine, automatically it's going to form an amine, okay? Automatically. This is clearly a primary amine. So step one, treat my acetone with my acid. The mechanism doesn't change. You use the acid, you regenerate the acid at the end. So I tell my Chem 124 and my Chem 24 students, the first thing you do is use up the acid. The last thing you do is make the acid, okay? You protonate and you form your conjugate base. Let me box that in because you have to keep track of that. That's gonna come back in at the end. Once I protonated my oxygen, my amine comes in. In this case, my ethylamine. Just like before, it attacks the carbonyl. Just like before, I have an OH. And I've got a nitrogen with a plus. If you look at your product, you have no oxygen. So I need to get rid of the OH in the form of water. So I need to do a proton transfer. Proton transfer. Takes the proton to form a water molecule. Now it's a great leaving group. And just like before, it can come off on itself to form a carbocation or the lone pairs can help it and push it off. So you form your water byproduct, which is what you're always going to form as a byproduct. And you form the precursor to your product, right? You've got your positive charge. And again, 
like I mentioned, your last step is regenerate your acid. So I need to bring up my conjugate base. In this case, it's H2PO4 minus and deprotonate to form my amine or imine, sorry. Okay. You guys see that? It only works for primary amines. It's great for aldehydes and ketones. So the only caveat is primary amine. Don't confuse that. Okay. Okay. What about secondary amines? Secondary amines can also react with aldehydes and ketones. And secondary amines just means that there's two R groups instead of one R group. It's still under acidic conditions. But instead of an imine, what you get is what's known as an enamine. Okay. So you can still treat them with secondary amines. It's not a problem. It's just a different product that you get. But what you'll notice is that the mechanism is pretty much the same thing. And so we'll go over that as well. And so enamine, the EN stands for the alkene, the double bond. And the amine has to be on the carbon that holds the double bond, not two doors down, not three doors down. That nitrogen has to be on that carbon alkene, okay? Hence enamine. Okay, so let's go over this mechanism. Again, it's exactly the same until the very last couple of steps, and it'll make sense why it sort of deviates a little bit. So let's start off with our aldehyde. And if you notice, I'm using the same aldehyde that I used um, to show you the imine mechanism. Just like before, you treat it with the acid, right? I'll use sulfuric acid again. If I use the acid the first step, I need to regenerate it at the end. Just like before, I protonate my carbonyl. Nothing has changed. I form my conjugate base. Same exact first step. Just like before, my amine comes in as a nucleophile. It attacks the carbonyl. I have an alcohol, a nitrogen. It's positive charge. So it's looking incredibly similar to the one where we just use the primary amine. Just like before, I need to get rid of that OH group. And in order to get rid of it, I need to make it into a great leading group. Okay. And it does a proton transfer. Exact same steps. Oh, see. Just like before, the water molecule can come off or the lone pairs on the nitrogen can help kick it off. It's 
So I have a, or I have water as my byproduct again, nothing has changed. And this is really the step where things kind of deviate a little bit. And it makes sense why they deviate, right? Typically when we form the nitrogen double bond, there's a proton and we can regenerate the conjugate base. And so we just deprotonate the nitrogen, but there's no proton on our nitrogen. Do you guys see that? So we can't do that. Oh, excuse me. The conjugate base still wants its proton. It's a catalyst. So it wants a hydrogen from somewhere. It can't take it from the nitrogen because the nitrogen doesn't have a proton. And so it takes it from the next best acidic site. And the next best acidic site is right next door to the amine. Why is this site acidic? Why is that carbon acidic? Because you have a nitrogen on the other side. And it can do resonance, right? It's resonance stabilized. Chem 24, resonance beats out everything. And if I draw out my resonance structure, I get my enamine. Do you see that? So instead of taking the proton from the nitrogen, since the nitrogen doesn't have a proton, the conjugate base is has to get back its hydrogen from somewhere. And it's going to take it from the most acidic side, and that's the neighboring carbon. And it's the most acidic side because it's resonance stabilized and it forms our enamine. So that's the only difference. It's this last step. And it makes sense because the nitrogen doesn't have a hydrogen. So it's pretty straightforward, okay? Not surprisingly, tertiary amines do not react with aldehydes and ketones because there's no hydrogen to them. So let me write that down. Tertiary amines do not react with aldehydes and ketones, okay? There's no proton on the nitrogens. There's all R groups, okay? So if I do react with nitrogen, it'll always be positively charged. There's no way I can neutralize that molecule. So let me give you an example that he's asked me to provide you with. And he's also wanted me to use acetone Okay, so again, just like before, when you look at the treatment of aldehydes and ketones with amines, take a look at the amine. The amine is going to tell you what your product's going to be. This is a secondary amine, automatically an enamine. I have to figure out how to make it an enamine, automatically. Okay, step one. Protonates, ooh, excuse me, form my conjugate base. My secondary amine comes in just like before. Don't let it throw you off that the amine is part of a ring now. The mechanism doesn't change. It just looks a little bit more crowded. But nothing has changed. Let me draw this bond a little bit nicer. 
Okay. I need to get rid of the OH. So I have to do a proton transfer before I do that. Now I can kick off my water molecule. I form water and I form my positively charged imine. There's no proton on the nitrogen that I can take off. So I look for the next best acidic site. And that's next door. Luckily for us, acetone is symmetrical, so it can deprotonate at either site, right? It doesn't matter which one it deprotonates from. And I form my enamine. Again, an alkene and an amine on the alkene, not two doors down. Okay. Okay, so that's for primary amines and secondary amines. Tertiary amines do not work out at all. The next reaction. is the cyanohydrin formation. Okay. So the cyanohydrin formation, as the name implies, you're adding a cyano group to an aldehyde or ketone. And then you can continue to derivatize it, but I just wanna focus on this specific reaction. And so there's a couple of methods to do it. Method number one, I'll use acetone, but again, it's for aldehydes and ketones. You can use HCN, which is an acid. And you form your cyanohydrin product. Okay. The HCN isn't a catalyst. The HCN is actually something that's being used up, as you can see, because the product has the nitrile group on there or the cyano group on there. So it's not a catalyst. You're actually using this and it's being used up. So first step, if it's an acid, the first thing that you're going to do is protonate. Okay, that's the first thing you do. Makes sense. The next thing, there's no nucleophile besides the cyano group, right? That you just made. So I introduce my cyano group. And so you can start seeing your product. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's just two steps, no acid catalyst. You use up your acid. Your acid is your electrophile and your nucleophile all at once, which is really nice. Pretty straightforward, okay? Okay. Method number two. is two steps.
Okay. And it requires the addition, step number one, of either sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide. Okay. And step number two requires a proton source. And your proton source can be water or acid. Okay. So we'll do it with acetone again. Step one, I'll use sodium cyanide. And step two, I'll use sulfuric acid. Yeah, he uses sulfuric acid. Okay. And again, you are going to get your cyanohydrin. But in this case, because you're starting off with the nucleophile first, not surprisingly, the nucleophile attacks first. So the roles have been just reversed from method number one and method number two, okay? In method number one, you protonated the oxygen first. In method number two, the nitrile comes in first. And you guys have done Gregnard reactions, right? To aldehydes and ketones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So it's like a Gregnard. It adds to the carbonyl, aldehydes and ketones. And then step two says, now we can protonate the oxygen to get our product. Okay. So it's just a reversal of steps. And those are the two methods. So let me stay here for a second because he wants me to talk about these nitrile groups or these cyano groups. Oops. Okay. And let me give you an example of these nitrile groups. So these nitrile groups are typically thought of as carbonyl groups. Carbonyls, okay? The only difference is, is that instead of being double bonded to an oxygen, it's triple bonded to a nitrogen. They have completely uh, different uh, valence electrons, number of valence electrons. So it's not surprising that it's triple bonded to a nitrogen. But you can convert nitriles to carboxylic acids. Okay. This carbon, let me highlight it in purple, is this carbon right here. Okay. And so just briefly, let me introduce the mechanism. <clears throat> In order to convert it nitrile to a carboxylic acid, you need acid, catalyst, and water. Okay. So just like any carbonyl system, the minute you add your acid, it protonates the nitrogen. Just like it protonated the oxygen, now it's protonating the nitrogen. You make your conjugate base. I'm gonna box this in because I need to keep track of it. Just like before, I've got a positive charge 
My nucleophile comes in. My nucleophile is a water molecule. So it adds to the carbon, and you can see how it's acting like a carbonyl, right? Exactly like a carbonyl, that's the electrophilic site. The electrons go towards the nitrogen. Okay. Please notice that we need to get rid of that nitrogen, right? And so we have to figure out a way to get rid of it. It does a proton transfer. Okay. So I've added at least one oxygen on there. I need to add my second oxygen. Water adds in again. So now I've got two oxygens on there and I need to figure out a way to get rid of that nitrogen. It does a second proton transfer. And now I can get rid of the nitrogen. Now my nitrogen wants to come off. It doesn't want to be positive, and this is perfect. I can either take it off or one of the oxygen lone pairs can help kick it off. And it's starting to look like my carboxylic acid. Okay. Please notice that for these reactions, you need to use the water molecule twice. And you need to use the water molecule twice because you have a carboxylic acid, two oxygens, and you have to get rid of nitrogen. So it makes sense that you have to use it twice. And then my last step is, of course, regenerate my acid and form my carboxylic acid. Okay. I'm sure he'll go over this reaction because it's also in your carboxylic acid chapter and in your nitrile chapter, but he wanted me to introduce it in this lecture as well, since we're talking about cyanohydrins, okay? Okay. Uh, one of the last reactions, also for aldehydes and ketones only, is the Vitic reaction. These are two T's. And it's probably one of the most popular organic reactions. Again, it's just for aldehydes and ketones. Ooh. Aldehydes and ketones. Okay. And you can actually form alkenes from the Wittig reaction. All you need is an aldehyde or a ketone. And you need what is known as an phosphorus illid. And illid is just a fancy word for double bond. Okay. So this is a phosphorus illid. Illid is just a fancy word for double bond between a carbon and a heteroatom. 
So you can have sulfur illids. Uh, in this case, it's a phosphorus illid. It's just a double bonded system. And the mechanism is as follows. You take the aldehyde and the ketone and you treat it with the phosphorus illid. Okay. And it forms a four membered ring. Intermediate. Okay. And then it collapses because you've learned that four membered rings are super strained. You can't isolate these. And so then it collapses. And if you follow your arrows at the top, you've got a phosphorus oxide, double bond, and you've got a double bond at the bottom. Your alkene. Okay. You guys see that? The take home message and what used to always help me was that I always had to form the phosphorus oxide. You always form your phosphorus oxide as your byproduct. So it tells you how to move your arrows when you're trying to collapse your four membered ring. I did them clockwise. You don't have to do them clockwise. You can do them counterclockwise. The point being is that your byproduct is always a phosphorus oxide. Always, no matter what. Okay? So make sure that when you're doing, you're drawing your arrows, you get the right byproduct and your alkene. So let me do a few examples. The beauty of it is that it can be an illid or double bonded system between a phosphorus and any carbon whatsoever, which is really nice. So I've just elongated the chain, that's it, okay? Instead of having two hydrogens on the carbon, I now have one hydrogen and an alkyl group, specifically a propyl group. The mechanism doesn't change. It just gets slightly a little bit more crowded. Okay. You still go through your four membered ring intermediate. If you need to number your carbons, you should number your carbons. Okay. And then again, you can't isolate this four membered ring, it collapses. You form your phosphorus oxide. Oh, excuse me. And you form your alkene. Okay. Not surprisingly, 
the majority of the time, the trans product is favored, right? The trans product is always favored just because it's more stable. The substituents are on the opposite side as opposed to the cis. They're facing each other and bumping into each other. So trans products are always the favored products, okay? Okay. Um, if you look at the resonance structure of my illid, and I'll use this specific illid. What you'll notice is that the phosphorus has the positive charge and the carbon has the negative charge. Do you guys see that? It's just a resonance. That's it. That's all it is. So if you look at the mechanism, you can start understanding why the oxygen on the aldehyde or the ketone reacts with the phosphorus because it is electrophilic. It wants to be attacked. It's positively charged. And you understand why the carbon is the nucleophile because that's where the negative charge is. Do you guys see that? All you have to do is draw the resonance structure to it. Both mechanisms are correct. They're just resonance structures of each other, which is really nice, okay? Okay. How do you make phosphorus illids? Or these illids. And luckily for us, it's just an SN2 reaction. Followed by an acid base reaction. So for example, let's make ooh, this phosphorosilid, okay? This is our product. You typically start with your triphenylphosphine because it's got two lone pairs, or it's got one lone pair, excuse me, an alkyl halide, and this is my SN2. So you guys know SN2 can do uh, methyl halides, primary, Alkyl halides, secondary, alkyl halides, allylic, benzylic, anything SN2 can do. Comes in, attacks, and kicks off the leaving group. Ooh. Plus Br minus. Okay. It's kind of starting to look like my illid, except I've got a hydrogen on a carbon, and I don't have that double bond yet. But I'm done with step one. Okay. Step two is my acid base reaction. I take the SN2 product I just made and I treat it with a base. And the most popular bases for these reactions are tert-butoxide or potassium tert-butoxide, which is a bulky base, or butyl lithium. Has he talked about butyl lithium to you guys? No? This is butyl lithium acts like a Grignard. When he introduced Grignards, I'm sure he told you it was a great nucleophile and a great base. But if you have to pick a job, Grignards and alkyl lithiums will always want to be bases before nucleophiles. So it acts as a base. It deprotonates to give you the negative charge on the carbon which is perfect because I just drew the resonance structure for you.
and you've got your ILID. If I draw my resonance, there's my double bond. You guys see that? Okay. So it's just two steps to make. Let me do a few more examples. Okay. You guys are taking the ACS, right? The minute you see a phosphorus, it's a Wittig reaction. It doesn't matter what's on that carbon, it's automatically a Wittig reaction, okay? So don't get intimidated by the substituents on that carbon. It's a Wittig reaction, okay? So if I look at my aldehyde, All you're worried about is that double bond between the phosphorus and carbon. You don't care about what's bonded to that carbon, okay? The mechanism doesn't change. You form your four-membered ring. Nothing has changed. It's going to collapse just like it did before. And just like before, it's going to form the phosphorus oxide at the top and your alkene. And ideally, your trans alkene. Do you guys see that? Okay. Nothing has changed whatsoever. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Okay, I've got a few more minutes. The other reaction that he wants me to go over is the Wolf Kishner. And I'll just briefly introduce it. And it's a reduction reaction. Okay. So you guys have learned reductions, lithium aluminum hydride, sodium borohydride. The Wolf Kishner works best for ketones. And it requires hydrazine potassium hydroxide, and heat. Okay. And it reduces the ketone. But the beauty of it is that it reduces it all the way to the alkane. Not a secondary alcohol but an actual alkane group, okay? So you get from a ketone to a CH2 or methylene group. Okay. I'll have him do the mechanism. I wanna make sure that you have time for your quiz today. I'll send this to him, have, it po have him post it. I don't know when he's gonna post it, 
So you might have to wait till tomorrow or next week, um, but I'll send this to him. And so let me go ahead 